Are you making your own probiotic drinks, sourdough, kraut, yogurt? Join HRN host and Brooklyn Kitchen's Harry Rosenblum and guests live and in person on Wednesday, March 8th at 6 p.m. to explore our modern relationship to ancient fermentation techniques and how to make them a part of your life. This is the first in HRN's Spring Live event series taking place on the second Wednesday of each month through May at Farm to People Kitchen and Bar in Bushwick, Brooklyn. Join the HRN community for expert panel discussions, hands-on workshops, tastings, and live Q&A. For more information or to reserve tickets, go to heritageradionetwork.org forward slash event series. Our partner, Farm to People, is an online farmer's market delivering in New York City. Get a free farm box, a $25 value, full of fresh-picked produce, pasture-raised meats, dairy, and more. Delivered right to your door when you sign up for Farm to People home delivery using the code FARM25. We look forward to seeing you on March 8th. Reserve tickets today at heritageradionetwork.org forward slash event series. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. Since 2009, HRN podcasts have been exploring the wide world of food, beverage, and agriculture. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org. This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. We've been making cheese in Wisconsin since before we were even a state which may be one reason why we win so many awards for it. It's what happens when a whole state dreams in cheese. Find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. I've had a number of sourdough starters in the last 15 years. Some I kept alive for a few weeks, some for a few months. But my most recent starter that I grew from scratch in April of 2020 has been serving me well for nearly three years. I bake with Shaggy about once a week, sometimes more often, sometimes less. He behaves differently in the summer than in the winter. If I neglect him in the fridge for too long, I need to do a little more work to get him ready to bake. Home fermentation is a living, breathing thing, and you have a relationship with it. What I've come to realize is that you have to be able to fit the fermentation into your life. When my kids were small, that wasn't as easy, and I let my starters expire. I made an offshoot of Shaggy with whole wheat flour on the suggestion of a friend and kept it alive for a few months, but recently realized I forgot about it in the back of the fridge, and that's okay. I don't have time to care for more than one starter, and I'm not baking enough to need more. Find the ferment that works for you, and it will meet you where you are. Sometimes you break up with a ferment and never see each other again. Sometimes you get back together and it works great for a time, only to slip away. When you make space for microbes in your life, it can be a rewarding and delicious experience. But like any relationship, it takes work. I'm Harry Rosenblum from Time for Lunch, and I grow microbes at home. This week on Meet and 3, we're breaking out our magnifying glass to explore the smallest corners of the food world. As Harry just alluded to, we start with the microbial. From there, we scale up, but only by a bit. From the tiniest of farmers to deceptive industrial practices, we set out to prove that the most interesting of stories can come in the smallest packages. And if, like Harry, you're fascinated by the prospect of cultivating microbes at home, we have just the event for you. On Wednesday, March 8th, Harry and HRN will be hosting Fermentation Never Sleeps at Farm to People in Bushwick, Brooklyn. It's a panel discussion and tasting, and it's all about inviting microbes into your personal culinary canon by approaching fermentation in a way that works for you. You can learn more and get tickets at the link in our show notes. And with that, I'm Matt Patterson, and this is Meat and 3 on HRN. Meat and 3. Meat and 3. Meat and 3. One meat, three sides. Food, news, and storytelling. A square meal for your ears. Meet and three. If not an affinity for crochet or an addiction to puzzles, maybe the COVID lockdowns granted you the opportunity to cultivate the perfect sourdough starter. In this story, we tune in to Melissa Metric and Wythe Marshall, hosts of the HRN podcast Fields, as they reflect on pandemic attitudes towards microbes and the ways that microflora contribute to our comfort foods. 
And like, I was asking my friend Kate who gave me her wild starter for the sourdough. And I was like, how did you create this sourdough? And she was like, I don't know. I just put some flour and water and put it on my windowsill. And we're like, ew. So this is your apartment yeast. The practice of sourdough has been used to make delicious loaves across many cultures for over 12,000 years. More than a skillful baker, crafting the perfect sourdough depends on microbes to perform a process called fermentation. Though microbes is a broad term, fermentation is mainly performed by bacteria or fungi, and the most famous of those is known as baker's yeast. They eat the natural sugars in flour and release acids and gases that make sourdough lofty and tangy. Microbes are in our ecosystem. That there's a whole ecosystem of fungi and bacteria, and it's all around us. And when we cultivate our own yeast, um, and when we preserve certain things um, in a safe way, that we're actually cultivating different um, varieties of these yeasts and and bacteria and things like that. It's a little ironic that cultivating sourdough seemed to become everyone's go-to hobby during the pandemic, a time of antiseptic hand gel and germophobia. After all, viruses are just another type of microbe. And obviously during a pandemic, we want to emphasize, you know, it makes total sense to control your environment, wipe it all down, especially if you're in a vulnerable population or it's very hard to get that distance. But with, with at the same time, many people are, who are worried about these things are also inviting the wild yeast. Whether we're talking food or medicine, the foundation for our modern perception of sanitization was laid by one man in the 19th century. Sir Louis Pasteur, one of the discoverers of the fact there are microbes, you know, period. You've probably heard of pasteurization, the process that's mandated by law in the U.S. to decrease pathogenic disease outbreaks from milk and dairy products. Yeah, it was named after Louis. The idea that we want to pasteurize everything, meaning remove the microbes, and the microbes are sort of the enemy, in that uh, that was a pasteurian sort of framework for controlling living things around us. Because before that, nobody cared about microbes because they didn't know microbes existed. And then, um, and actually, if anything, they did love microbes. They just didn't think of them as microbes, but they made beer, right, and bread, Mm -hmm. uh, wine, and whatever else, cheese. So um, in a way, the pasteurian framework for controlling environments um, was linked to, yeah, like uh, changes in basic science, but also, yeah, to medicine and the idea of clean surgical theaters um, and, and, and food safety, the idea that we want our food um, to be not, you know, infiltrated by, by pathogenic microbes. Before Pasteur, the dominant scientific understanding was that disease was transmitted through miasma, a form of noxious bad air. Nobody imagined that individual, seemingly invisible particles could cause illness. But fast forward to the pandemic era, and more than any other time in history, humans across the globe upended our ways of living to try to avoid those very particles. During shelter-in-place, while we were taking immense precautions to protect against one microbe, we were simultaneously welcoming another into our daily lives for our health and entertainment. I think that tension is, is really interesting when at the same time you have a pandemic and people are definitely, you know, trying to kill all the microbes, but then they're going home and creating wild yeast starters. And so inviting in uh, this, this random kind of wild yeast, this is kind of a hypothesis, but, you know, relating to yeast in a less scary way as a kind of friendly organism that's helping you produce something. So it's a useful tool, even a kind of like a pet, like a plant, like it doesn't do much. You Uh, eat it. You have to feed it twice a day. Microbiologists have figured out that how you tend to your sourdough starter impacts the taste of your bread. A warmer kitchen, for example, allows lactic acid bacteria to thrive, making your bread more sour. Depending on what flour you give your yeast to feed on, completely different microflora can result. What this means is that the sourdough fostered in your particular kitchen has a unique terroir that can't be replicated elsewhere, much like the world's finest wines and cheeses. I definitely think part of the idea of of growing your own food, growing locally, growing in an urban environment could be uh, not just growing plants and mushrooms in your backyard or on your windowsill, but also working with microbes and thinking about the place of microbes in food production and preservation. And, you know, yeah, it's it's about seeing what is food uh, differently and enjoying some of that version of, of locality. If you want to dive deeper into the world of urban farms and sometimes fungi, Melissa and Wythe are getting ready to release a new season of Fields this spring. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts.
For our next story, Vaidehi Curiati takes us to Spain to experience her region's culture of small plates. A little over a year ago, I landed in San Sebastian, Spain, just in time for Santo Tomas, a celebration held across the Basque Country. My first day here was filled to the brim with countless rounds of chistora and a glass of sidra to accompany them. I was blown away by the unique Basque culinary culture. I had never tasted anything like it. And I could finally see why the Basque country, and San Sebastian in particular, is one of the world's most well-known culinary destinations. I sometimes remark that Basque food was my primary motivation for moving to San Sebastian shortly thereafter. Basque food is incredibly complex and diverse, but after eating my way through the region, I quickly realized that the real star of this gastronomic tapestry was the small but mighty pincho. You could say that the pincho is a little bit of a more elaborate version of a tapa. A tapa tends to be like a small um, plate of kind of like the same type of food, like some potatoes or some fried fish. Whereas a pincho is generally a miniature dish. So it can be mounted on bread or it can be as elaborate as like a small plate with a roasted beef cheek and some mashed potatoes. Taking its name from the toothpicks used to hold a piece of bread with a variety of small dishes, the Basque tradition of pinchos originated in San Sebastian in the 1930s. I spoke to food writer Marty Buckley about this tiny dish and its place within the Basque country's foodscape. As Marty mentioned, despite its similarities to the more popular Spanish dish tapa, pinchos possess a culinary identity and context of their own. Not only are they creatively composed using fresh local ingredients, pinchos are also tied to a unique eating culture. Locals have always treated the pincho as a precursor to a meal. A pincho is still something on a random Tuesday, you pop into a bar because you still have to wait another hour or two before dinner and you're hungry and you just grab a a drink and a pincho. It's like very much part of our day um, versus being like a special event. And so jumping from bar to bar used to be just like a part of a local's afternoon tradition or a weekend tradition. For Basque people, pinchos are more than just bites of food. Going to a bar for pinchos and a drink after work also involves getting together with other people. In other words, to socialize in the Basque country often is to go for pinchos with your friends and family. And when it comes to enjoying pinchos, settling for one bar is not an option. Almost always, you will find yourself moving from one bar to the next, sampling different varieties of pinchos, always with a chacoli or zurito in your hand. I will never forget my first experience with pinchos. Um, I remember walking on what I now know is the busiest, most touristy street in San Sebastian, which of course I didn't know then. This was back in 2005 and I was a college student. And I just walked into this tiny bar. The counter was covered in food. And I just thought it was incredible that you could just take whatever you wanted, have a drink and talk to your friends and just kind of pay with the honesty system at the end. I just thought it was incredible. Since the 1990s, the unique pincho culture has also captured the attention of tourists. I think that the pincho's relation to San Sebastian's culinary fame is really inextricable. The tradition of going for pinchos is part of what has like captivated the public's imagination with San Sebastian. And it's a major um, like reason for people to come to visit this area. And so I think that and it just kind of serves to cement San Sebastian is like a really special place, culinarily speaking. And I have to agree. My first experience with pinchos is what drew me to the gastronomic and cultural world of the Basque country. A year later, like many other natives and expats, I find myself organizing my culinary and social life around the small act of going for pinchos every week. We'll be right back with more Meet and 3 after a brief break.
This episode is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. There's a reason when you think of Wisconsin, you think cheese. Cheese is a huge part of Wisconsin's history and future. In Wisconsin, the state of cheese, the tradition of cheesemaking excellence began 180 years ago, before Wisconsin was recognized as a state. Immigrants traveled to settle in this lush, green hills of Wisconsin, bringing their cheesemaking traditions with them. These storied skills combined with the freshest milk available created a cheesemaking culture that is uniquely Wisconsin. Wisconsin's 1,200 cheesemakers, many of whom are third and fourth generation, continue to pass on old world traditions while adopting modern innovations in cheesemaking craftsmanship. Find your next favorite cheese at wisconsincheese.com. Welcome back to Meet and Three. Up next, Stella Maiden acquaints us with agriculture on the smallest scales. And no, I'm not talking about the basil on your balcony. When you think of farming, ants probably don't come to mind. But these tiny yet mighty creatures have been farming since long before humans roamed the earth. And while they aren't growing little gem lettuce or even microgreens, some species have managed to sustainably farm fungi. I spoke with Ted Schultz, a research entomologist at Smithsonian's Museum of Natural History, to learn more about what he calls one of the greatest wonders of nature. It's been evolving for something like 66 million years. And it's true, in my opinion, true agriculture. Um, the ants cultivate fungi, which they eat for food, and they've been doing it for a really long time. But make no mistake, these fungi farming ants are not growing mushrooms, at least not intentionally. The mushrooms we know and eat are actually the fruiting bodies of mycelium, a network of tiny fungal threads. Mycelium most resemble wisps of cotton, collections of thin white strands, and they spread up beneath the surface of the soil or trees, or anywhere you find a mushroom. The ants aren't trying to cultivate mushrooms, they're trying to cultivate mycelia. Well, I'm not exactly sure why they want to prevent mushroom formation, but I think that um, it's it's inefficient, it would be inefficient. Um, they, could, they could probably eat the mushroom tissue, but it's much better for them to, um, to eat graze on the mycelium. So um, it's that's it's probably something as simple as that. Like it's just better to eat mycelium than to allow all the mycelium to kind of make a big mushroom and then have to cut up that mushroom and eat it. And they may be less um, less able to eat a mushroom. There are over 240 species of atine ants. So why did they evolve to be fungi farmers in the first place? One possible clue as to how it got started is that at the end of the Cretaceous, there was a sort there was what we call nuclear winter conditions, where for a period of um, I think it's probably on the order of tens of thousands of years, uh, photosynthesis got shut down. Plants weren't able to photosynthesize because sunlight was not really getting through this huge dust layer in the atmosphere. And so a lot of plants died and a, obviously a lot of creatures went extinct. In particular, creatures that that depended on plants either directly or indirectly for for their growth. And the kinds of creatures that persisted through that period were creatures that were Detritivores that were good at digesting um, detritus, little bits of decaying matter. Because um, if you depended on, you know, giant trees or something like that, you were you, you you were really in trouble. And so that probably what was going on that the ants maybe had already had some kind of a symbiotic relationship with these fungi, and then. Um, when this thing happened, this big catastrophe, they were pre-adapted kind of to make it through by because they could find little bits of organic matter, bring them all together, 
feed them to a fungus and the fungus, so the fungus would eat that stuff. And then the fungus would share the nu- nutrition by le- getting eaten itself. Although the nuclear winter conditions of the dinosaur age have long since passed, fungi farming ants keep on farming. Surely this tedious work isn't simply a passion project. They became fungus growers, and there's pretty much the, no other option is open to them now. The, and we know this from a lot of different angles, like um, fungus farming ants um, have lost the ability to make one of the amino acids arginine. And a lot of... Um, I don't, we don't know of any other ants that have lost that ability. And our theory is, well, they, they, they get it from the fungus. Um, now you could say, well, what about the fungi? Why, why do they have to stay in the relationship? And in some ways they don't. So there's, what we know is there's a bunch of different, a bunch of different fungi that the ants are cultivating. Most of them are related to each other. Some of them have evolved from the other ones, but the main sort of ancestral pool of fungi seem to be able to live without the ants. But then there's these other fungi that evolved from those that something happened and now they are, we we call it domestication. Now they're totally dependent on the ants. They're never found apart from the ants. Ted acknowledges the similarities between ant and human agricultural practices. For one, farming ants shape and weed their gardens just as we do. But more importantly, he believes these similarities can teach us something. Maybe we could get a clue from studying all the non-human agriculture, not just ants. There's fungus farming termites. There's all kinds of um, other non-human agriculturalists out there. And as for the ants? They've practiced a kind of sustainable agriculture for, for, you know, 60 six million years, in particular leaf cutter ants. A leaf cutter ant colony in the tropics is the equivalent of a mammalian herbivore like a cow. It eats as much as a cow every day of fresh leaves. It uh, lives as longer than a cow. It lives 15 to 20 years, that colony. Um, and it, and, and so, and it weighs as much as a cow. If you took all the ants out and if you, and weighed them, they'd weigh as much as a, as a a mammalian herbivore and they and yet they're not decimating their environments they go out they they start cutting leaves on a tree at some point they quit and they move on to the next tree and so those trees for many years can live coexist with the ants perhaps this phenomenon is proof that bigger isn't always better For our final story, Rana Rudy highlights an industrial practice that's becoming increasingly common, and one man who argues that maybe not all small packages are a good thing. From soda to cereal and even toilet paper, companies are secretly shrinking the size of their products, but you pay the same. And you've probably noticed this, right? Back in the day, you bought a big bag of chips. Everyone ate. These days, you open the bag, and there's just one chip holding the size to make it look big. (laughs) Many of us can recall a moment when we felt that specific pang of disappointment, opening up a bag of chips only to find there are just a sad few to snack on. We have shrinkflation to thank for that, the phenomenon where companies downsize their products but keep the price the same, and it has caused outrage from consumers all over the world. Amongst all this, there is one man who became so filled with indignation it pushed him to devote his life to investigating and exposing this business practice that companies have been pulling for decades. I turned to the shrinkflation expert, Edgar Drowski, to learn more about shrinkflation and what we as consumers can do to stay alert. Downsizing and shrinkflation is one of those kind of nasty tricks that manufacturers use to raise the price. You know, they can raise the price directly, but they know consumers are going to catch that for the most part. They can reformulate their product with cheaper ingredients, or they can make the product just a little bit smaller. So it costs them less, but they charge you the same amount. It's a 
backdoor price increase. Isn't it the perfect scam if you don't know that you've been taken advantage of? I'm pointing out the the tricks and traps in the supermarket game. Yet to many reporters and media outlets today, shrinkflation is a brand new topic. It isn't. It's been really going on since the days of the nickel candy bar. Edgar is a self-proclaimed bargain hunter and has been training his keen eye for decades. I've been tracking um, downsizing, as I always used to call it. The newfangled term is shrinkflation, um, probably since I was a teenager back in the 1960s. I remember my Mounds candy bar that always used to be two ounces became one point something. And I remember when... um, P&G's Charmin toilet paper came out with Mr. Whipple in those famous commercials. Ladies, you can't squeeze the Charmin. But this isn't Charmin, Mr. Whipple. This is new Charmin. Even more... It used to have 650 sheets on a roll. Today's Charmin, if you could find the equivalent of those rolls, it would be 90% fewer sheets. So it's just something as an alert shopper that I followed. And when I became a consumer advocate, I would bring things into the office. Look at these two deodorant sticks. One of them is two ounces and one of them is an ounce and a half, yet they kind of looked about the same size. So noticing that manufacturers made these kind of sneaky tweaks to their products, taking out some sheets of paper products, taking out some ounces of other types of packaged goods um, caught people's attention, and I started writing about it. Edgar's passion for this topic fueled him to start his own website, a platform where he exposes these companies and writes up all of his discoveries. I created mouseprint.org about 16 years ago, where I wrote about the strings and catches that are buried in the fine print of advertising, on product labels, and in contracts. The print was so small, only a mouse could read it. Edgar gets consumer tips from readers. These tips lead him to investigate consumer products of all types, ranging from the constantly shrinking detergent bottle, the withering toilet paper roll, and even cough syrup, where there are claims that the formula contains fewer doses of cough syrup for the same price. His latest find? The downsizing of a popular ice cream brand. Ice cream has a long history of being downsized. You know, 20 plus years ago, used to buy a half gallon of ice cream. Then they went down to 56 ounces. You lost a full cup. And after that, um, about 15 years ago, they went down to 48 ounces. Well, just in the past few months, Turkey Hill, which is a major national brand, went down from 48 to 46 ounces. Um, I had gotten a tip about this ran down to my local supermarket, and sure enough, there they were on the shelf, side by side, same flavor. One was 48 ounces, one was 46 ounces. Really hard to tell a slight shape difference to the product. Um, But, you know, one had black type and one had red type. So that's kind of the most recent find that I've made. So, What can consumers do about this never-ending shrinking to our favorite products? Most people, I think, just kind of go to the supermarket, have their cart, they grab, put it in the cart, and go. You can't just be a (laughs) grabber-and-goer, if you will. Um, You have to pay attention. You have to become net weight conscious. Look at the net weight. Look at the net count on paper products, memorize it. So when you go back to the store, you can double check that the item still has in it what it always used to. While Edgar did stress to me that shrinkflation has been going on for decades and will continue to go on for decades, he also shared hope in the power of consumer voices. Consumers did have an impact in the case of smart balance margarine. The old smart balance was 64% oil. The new smart balance went down to 39% oil, almost a 40% decrease. Consumers noticed, because think about it, you, 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 know, you spread margarine on bread. What do you taste? The bread doesn't have an awful lot of flavor, so you taste the margarine. 
and they complained. There are over 2,000 one-star reviews on the ConAgra website for Smart Balance. That's the manufacturer's website. They actually listened. And because of all the consumer complaints, they just recently said they were coming back out with the old formula. The next time you notice something is a little off about the size of your deodorant or the amount of chips in your bag, it might just be worth letting the manufacturer know you're on to them. You may just get your original full-size product back. That's our show. Thanks for listening. Learn more about the guests and topics we touched on this week by checking out our show notes. Special thanks this week to Bianca Garcia, Baidehi Kudiati, Stella Maiden, Rana Rudy, and Taylor Early. Meet and 3 is produced by Kevin Chang Barnum, Katie Mosman Wadler, and me, Matt Patterson. Our audio engineer for this episode is Kevin Chang Barnum. Our theme song was composed by Breakmaster Cylinder. This program is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council. Meet and 3 is powered by Simplecast. Meet and 3 is a production of Heritage Radio Network, the world's pioneer food radio station. Learn more at heritageradionetwork.org and follow us at heritage underscore radio. And please stay in touch. Whether you have a story idea or would just like to say hey, write us at ideas at meetin3.nyc. That's all spelled out. <laughs>